Hello, this is Mike Parker. Welcome to the Hurricane Utah Adult Religion class sponsored by the Hurricane Utah North Stake of the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints. I'd like to give a special welcome to all the new subscribers to this channel. I'm recording this in early January 2024 and hundreds of people have recently subscribed to help with their Come Follow Me study of the Book of Mormon. I'm thrilled that you found value in these lessons. The Hurricane Utah Adult Religion class meets on Thursday evenings between September and May. We discuss the scriptures of the Restored Church of Jesus Christ. If you live in or are visiting the Hurricane St. George area, please feel free to join us. Links to the class website are available in the show notes for this video. On the website, you can download my notes, which includes footnotes documenting my sources, this PowerPoint slide presentation, and handouts that I distribute in class. Please note that this YouTube channel and the class website are not official sites of The Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints, the Hurricane Utah North Stake, or any other church unit or department. I alone am responsible for these sites and the materials on them. If you enjoy this lesson, please click the like button and share it with a friend. And if you haven't already subscribed, please do so. That way you'll be notified when new content is posted to this channel. In this lesson, we'll be studying the short books of Enos, Jerem, Omni, and Words of Mormon, as well as chapter one of the Book of Mosiah. The books of Enos, Jerem, and Omni contain the brief writings of a succession of Nephite authors who finished the record on the small plates of Nephi. These authors were Enos, son of Jacob, nephew of Nephi, and grandson of Lehi. After his father's death, he had a miraculous conversion experience. Jerem, son of Enos, he had the gifts of prophecy and revelation, but he did not write any of his own revelations. Omni, the son of Jerem, the short book named for him, contains the writings of five men. He himself wrote only three verses of text. Amaron, son of Omni, and author of just five verses of text, many wicked Nephites were killed during his lifetime. Chemish, brother of Amaron, and the author of only a single verse of text. Abinadom, son of Chemish, and author of two verses of text, there was much war and contention between the Nephites and Lamanites in his lifetime. Amalekai, son of Abinadon, and the last descendant of Lehi to write on the small plates of Nephi. He participated in and described the migration of righteous Nephites to the land of Zarahemla. Mormon was a prophet in the fourth century AD and the last record keeper of the Nephite people. He abridged the large plates of Nephi onto his own set of gold plates. He added the small plates of Nephi to his own record and explained this insertion by writing the short book called Words of Mormon. The Book of Mosiah is the earliest surviving portion of his abridgment of the large plates. Several other important people are mentioned in the books we'll be discussing. Zarahemla was the leader of a people and a land which were both named after him. His ancestor, Mulek, was a son of King Zedekiah of Judah. Mulek had sailed to the New World around the same time as Lehi. Mosiah was a Nephite prophet during the days of Amalickiah. He led a group of righteous Nephites to the land of Zarahemla, where he was made their king. He's the first of two people in this lesson named Mosiah, so he's designated in my slides with a subscript one after his name. Benjamin was a son of Mosiah and the second king of the combined community of Nephites and the people of Zarahemla. Mosiah too was a son of Benjamin and heir to his throne. He's indicated with a subscript two after his name. This lesson covers nearly four centuries of Nephite history. Following the death of Jacob, the Nephites living in the land of Nephi began a long spiritual decline that resulted in the destruction of many of the wicked people among them. Three centuries later, a group of righteous Nephites led by Mosiah 
emigrated north to the land of Zarahemla. There they discovered the people of Zarahemla and united with them. Mosiah became their king. Mosiah's son, Benjamin, inherited his father's throne and led his people in righteousness. He chose his eldest son, Mosiah II, to succeed him, circa 127 BC. About 500 years after the time of Benjamin, around AD 375, Mormon, the Nephite prophet who abridged and compiled the Book of Mormon, added an explanation of why he inserted the small plates of Nephi into his record. To help us conceptualize the action that takes place in the Book of Mormon, in this course I'll use the BYU Virtual Scriptures Book of Mormon map. I'm grateful to Dr. Tyler Griffin and Dr. Taylor Halverson, co-founders of the BYU Virtual Scriptures Group, for generously giving me permission to use their conceptual map in my slides. The Book of Mormon narrative in this lesson begins in the land of Nephi, inland from the western coast where Lehi and his family had landed. Under the leadership of Mosiah, a group of righteous Nephites left the land of Nephi and came down into the land which is called the land of Zarahemla. This move shifted the center of Nephite civilization north to the land of Zarahemla, where it remained until the time of Mormon. Following Mosiah's departure, the land of Nephi became the center of the Lamanite population. The books of Enos, Jerem, and Omni, and the first chapter of Mosiah, cover nearly 400 years of history, from the period following Jacob's death, which I estimate to be circa 498 BC, to the end of the reign of King Benjamin, 476 years after Lehi's departure from Jerusalem, circa 127 BC. Beginning with the record of Enos, son of Jacob, Enos began his record by praising his father Jacob, calling him a just man who taught me in his language and also in the nurture and admonition of the Lord. I want to note Enos's mention of being taught in his father's language. We'll return to this at the end of the lesson when we discuss Mosiah chapter one, because something similar also appears there. I think it tells us something important about the Nephites. Enos wrote of the wrestle which he had before God. His use of the word wrestle is almost certainly a deliberate reference to his distant ancestor, Jacob, the grandson of Abraham, who wrestled all night with a divine being, an angel or perhaps Jehovah himself, and then received the new name Israel and made a covenant with the Lord. Jacob was also the name of Enos's father, which makes the use of wrestle even more impactful. Enos recorded his conversion story in Enos chapter one, verses three through six. Quote, Behold, I went to hunt beasts in the forests, and the words which I had often heard my father speak concerning eternal life and the joy of the saints sunk deep into my heart. And my soul hungered, and I kneeled down before my maker, and I cried unto him in mighty prayer and supplication for mine own soul, and all the day long did I cry unto him. Yea, and when the night came, I did still raise my voice high that it reached the heavens. And there came a voice unto me, saying, Enos, thy sins are forgiven thee, and thou shalt be blessed. And I, Enos, knew that God could not lie, wherefore my guilt was swept away. Unquote. Once we have received a remission of our sins, our feelings of guilt and shame should be swept away. Jesus Christ has paid for our sins. We are no longer held accountable for them. Continuing to experience guilt is a tactic of Satan to make us feel unworthy and cause us to doubt our salvation. Elder Dale G. Renlund of the Quorum of the Twelve Apostles taught, quote, Jesus Christ can forgive because he paid the price for our sins. Our Redeemer chooses to forgive because of his incomparable compassion, mercy, and love. Our Savior wants to forgive because this is one of his divine attributes. And 
like the good shepherd he is, he is joyful when we choose to repent. The fact that we can repent is the good news of the gospel. Guilt can be swept away. We can be filled with joy, receive a remission of our sins, and have peace of conscience. We can be freed from feelings of despair and the bondage of sin. We can be filled with the marvelous light of God and be pained no more. Repentance is not only possible, but also joyful because of our Savior." Unquote. The Lord then told Enos, Thy faith hath made thee whole. The Savior used this phrase when he healed the woman with the issue of blood, Bartimaeus the blind man, and the leper who came back to him and gave thanks to God. In this case, Enos's wholeness from being healed was spiritual instead of physical. After receiving forgiveness for his own sins, Enos prayed on behalf of his brethren, the Nephites. The Lord reiterated the covenant conditions he had given to Lehi and his family. His blessings on the Nephites were conditional on their diligence in keeping my commandments. Notice the Lord's pessimistic outlook here. He didn't present his covenant promise concerning the land as two alternative outcomes. If ye shall keep my commandments, ye shall prosper in the land, but if ye will not keep my commandments, ye shall be cut off from my presence. Rather, the Lord seemed quite certain that the Nephites would turn to iniquity, and he would bring down sorrow upon their heads. As we'll see shortly, this took place within a few generations. Enos seems to have noted the Lord's gloomy outlook for the future of the Nephites, so his concern turned to the future of the Lamanites. Enos prayed with many long strugglings for his brethren, the Lamanites, and he desired that the record of the Nephites, the small plates of Nephi, might be preserved so that it could restore the Lamanites to righteousness at some future day. The Nephites had labored in vain to restore the Lamanites to the true faith, but the Lamanites had sworn to destroy the Nephites and their records. Enos may have expected that the destruction of the Nephites and the reclamation of the Lamanites would happen much sooner than we now know the Lord's timetable turned out to be. The Lord promised to bring forth the record in his own due time, not the one Enos anticipated. Enos then gave his assessment of the state of the Nephites and Lamanites. He contrasted the lack of civilization among the Lamanites with the civilized culture of the Nephites. His choice of terminology was a deliberate contrast. The Lamanites hunted wild prey and ate raw meat, while the Nephites kept domesticated flocks and cattle and ate harvested grain and fruit. Enos was not opposed to hunting. He himself was a hunter. But hunting was a component of the Nephite lifestyle, not its dominant feature. The Lamanites were nomadic, living in tents. Nephi had written that his people lived in buildings they constructed. The Lamanites worshipped idols and were filthy spiritually and physically. They wore loincloths and shaved their heads which the Nephites would have seen as violations of the law of Moses. But not all was right among the Nephites. Near the end of Jacob's ministry, following his encounter with Sherem, the Nephites had repented and experienced a spiritual renewal. Now, after only a single generation, Enos described his people as stiff-necked and lacking understanding. The spiritual decline of the Nephites would continue for the next 140 years until the more wicked part of the Nephites were destroyed. Enos chapter 1 verse 25 contains the first chronological statement since Jacob chapter 1 verse 1, when it was the Nephites' 55th year, circa 542 BC. It was now their 179th year, circa 420 BC. This chronology presents us with something of a challenge. 
Jacob was born during Lehi's eight-year journey in the wilderness. Assuming his birth was in 591 BC, Jacob would have been 50 years old at the beginning of his record. We have no mention of the passage of time since then, so we don't know how old Jacob was when he died. But by Enos 125, it had been 124 years since the last time reference. For the chronology to work, the three following things must all be true. One, Enos must have been born in Jacob's old age. Two, Jacob and Enos must have both lived very long lives. And three, Jacob must have lived long enough to teach Enos in his language and also in the nurture and admonition of the Lord. This is my proposed solution to the chronology. Lehi left Jerusalem in 596 BC. Jacob was born five years after Lehi's departure in 591 BC. This date is conjectural. Jacob was 50 years old at the start of his own book. This was 55 years after Lehi's departure, so 542 BC. Enos was born in Jacob's 85th year in 507 BC. This date is conjectural. 100 years after Lehi's departure in 498 BC, Jacob died at age 95. This was in Enos's 10th year. This date is also conjectural. Enos died at age 89 in the 179th year after Lehi's departure, circa 420 BC. My proposed chronology would, of course, require that Enos's mother be considerably younger than his father, Jacob. Since plural marriage was not permitted among the Nephites, per Jacob's instructions, Jacob would have to have remarried after his first wife died in order to bear a son who could be his heir. At the end of his days, Enos described himself as having been wrought upon by the power of God. His encounter with God continued to be the foundational event and guiding experience in his life. The book of Jerem is the shortest book in the Book of Mormon. It was the record of Jerem, son of Enos and grandson of Jacob. Jerem gave us two dates in his record. 200 years had passed away, circa 397 BC, and 238 years had passed away, circa 359 BC. Jerem's record was shorter than his father's, possibly because the small plates of Nephi were nearly full and partly because he felt he didn't have anything to add to what had already been recorded. For what could I write more than my fathers have written, he declared. Jerem noted the continuing Nephite spiritual decline, but he also recognized God's mercy and that he had not as yet swept them off from the face of the land, as his father had prophesied would happen. Despite the deteriorating spiritual state of his people, Jerem wrote, that there were many revelations among them, and faithful Nephites kept the law of Moses and the Sabbath day holy. Still, the prophets had to threaten the people of Nephi to get them to keep the commandments. He mentioned that the Nephites and the Lamanites had spread out across the land of Nephi, and that the Lamanites were exceedingly more numerous than the Nephites. Societies that exist on agriculture and domestication of animals have lower mortality rates than hunter-gatherer societies. So how did the Lamanite population grow so much faster than the Nephites? There are at least two possibilities. First, the Lamanites had integrated with other existing peoples in the New World, and the Nephites considered all who weren't Nephites to be Lamanites. Second, the Lamanites had become domesticated and turned to agriculture, and Enos and Jerem's descriptions of them as feeding on wild beasts were exaggerations, delib deliberately designed to contrast the righteousness of Nephites with the unrighteousness of the Lamanites. I find this second option less plausible. Despite the Lamanites' overwhelming numbers, the Nephites in Jerem's time managed to secure their lands and fortify their cities and they were materially prosperous. The Book of Omni contains the writings of five authors and spans a period of over 200 years. 
Verses 1 through 3 contain the record of Omni, son of Jerem. Although Omni was a Nephite by blood, he was not one by religious practice. He was a self-confessed wicked man who had not kept the statutes and the commandments of the Lord as he ought to have done. This was a surprisingly honest confession. Despite his spiritual failings, Omni defended his people against the continual attacks of the Lamanites, and he made a brief entry on the small plates before passing them down to his son, Amaron. Verses 4 through 8 are the record of Amaron, son of Omni. In the 320th year of the Nephites, circa 281 BC, the destruction of the Nephites that Amaron's grandfather Jerem and great-grandfather Enos had predicted came to pass. The more wicked part of the Nephites, possibly the ruling class, were destroyed as a consequence of not keeping the Lord's commandments. Amaron passed the plates to his brother, possibly because he himself had no sons. Verse 9 is the record of Chemish, son of Omni and brother of Amaron. Chemish's entry is the shortest one made by the nine keepers of the small plates of Nephi. His brief writings consist of only 69 English words. He told us nothing of his days, nor anything of significance. Verses 10 and 11 are the record of Abinadom, son of Chemish. Abinadom lived in a time of continuing war and contention between the Nephites and the Lamanites. He wrote, I know of no revelation, save, or except, that which has been written, neither prophecy. Wherefore, that which is sufficient is written. His remark has often been interpreted to mean that the Nephites were continuing to decline spiritually and that the gifts of revelation and prophecy had ceased among them. Another way to interpret it is that there were revelations and prophecies among the Nephites in his time, and they were written down, but they were not included on the small plates of Nephi due to limited space left on them. The rest of the book of Omni, from verse 12 to verse 30, contains the record of Amalekai, son of Abinadom. Amalekai was the last writer on the small plates of Nephi. He documented significant changes in Nephite civilization that affected the rest of their history as a people. These events probably took place during the life of his father, Abinadom. Amalekai wrote about Mosiah, a righteous prophet who was warned of the Lord that he should flee out of the land of Nephi, and as many as would hearken unto the voice of the Lord should also depart out of the land with him into the wilderness. Led by many preachings and prophesyings, and by the power of God, they traveled north, descending in elevation from the highland areas of the land of Nephi into the lowland area of the land of Zarahemla. There they discovered the people of Zarahemla, who were the descendants of another group of Israelites who had also escaped the destruction of Jerusalem and had sailed to the Western Hemisphere around the same time as Lehi's family. The man who led that group out of Jerusalem is not named in the book of Omni, but we learn later that his name was Mulek and that he was a son of King Zedekiah of Judah. Because the people of Zarahemla were the descendants of the group led by Mulek, they are sometimes called the Mulekites, even though that term is not used in the Book of Mormon. Mulek and his followers had journeyed in the wilderness of the Old World and were brought by the hand of the Lord across the great waters to the New World. Unlike Lehi, who had landed on the west coast of the Promised Land, Mulek's group landed on the east coast, north of the land of Zarahemla, near where the Jaredite civilization had been. From there, they had migrated south to the land of Zarahemla. When Mosiah arrived, the people of Zarahemla far outnumbered his small band of Nephites. Mulek's group, however, had failed to bring any records with them, so their language had become corrupted, and they denied the being of their creator. Mosiah had them taught in his language. Omni chapter 1 verse 19 tells us, that the people of Zarahemla and the people of Mosiah did unite together, and Mosiah was appointed to be their king. Mosiah had the gift of seership through which he could translate and interpret ancient writings. 
The Mulekites had a large stone with words engraved on it, a stele, that Mosiah translated by the power of God. The record on the stone contained an account of Coriantumr, the last Jaredite king and sole survivor of his people, who had lived the last nine months of his life among the people of Zarahemla. We'll read more about Coriantumr when we get to the Book of Ether near the end of this course. Amalekai recorded that when Mosiah died, his son Benjamin succeeded him as king of the Nephites and the people of Zarahemla. Benjamin was a righteous and just man. During Benjamin's reign, the Lamanites came down from the land of Nephi and attacked the Nephites, resulting in a serious war and much bloodshed. Mormon wrote that King Benjamin gathered together his armies, and he did stand against them, and he did fight with the strength of his own arm with the sword of Laban. Amalekai, who himself had no children, decided to give the small plates of Nephi to King Benjamin. Amalekai wrote that the plates were full, so he closed the record with his testimony of Christ. In what appears to be an afterword written sometime later, Amalekai included a brief account of a certain number of Nephites who decided to return to the land of Nephi. They went up into the wilderness, he wrote, where their leader, being a strong and mighty man and a stiff-necked man, caused contention among them, and they were all slain, save fifty. The survivors returned to Zarahemla, gathered a considerable number of additional Nephites, including Amalekai's brother, and left again for the land of Nephi. They had not been heard from by the time Amalekai died. We'll learn more about this group in Mosiah chapters 9 and 10, which we'll discuss two lessons from this one. Words of Mormon is a short book between the books of Omni and Mosiah. It is Mormon's explanation of why he inserted the small plates of Nephi into his own plates of Mormon. This is the first time we encounter the writings of Mormon. We've previously seen his name on the title page, and we know, of course, that the Book of Mormon is named for him. Mormon was the last prophet of the Nephites. By his time, 500 years after the time of King Benjamin, the Nephite people had been almost completely destroyed. Mormon informed us that he had abridged the account from the large plates of Nephi down to the reign of King Benjamin, after which he searched through all the records he had in his possession and found the small plates of Nephi. He was so pleased with the contents of this small record that he put them with his own plates of Mormon without abridging them. He then added this small book, The Words of Mormon, as an explanation of what he had done. He wrote in Words of Mormon, verse 7, quote, And I do this for a wise purpose, for thus it whispereth me, according to the workings of the Spirit of the Lord which is in me. And now I do not know all things, but the Lord knoweth all things which are to come. Wherefore, he worketh in me to do according to his will. Unquote. The Lord's wise purpose, unknown to Mormon at the time, was for the record on the small plates to serve as the replacement for the book of Lehi, the 116 manuscript pages Martin Harris would lose in the summer of 1828. After explaining his editorial process, Mormon summarized the events that took place between the end of the book of Omni on the small plates and the book of Mosiah, his abridgment from the record on the large plates. After Amalekai gave the small plates of Nephi to King Benjamin, Benjamin put them with the large plates that had been kept by the Nephite kings. These two sets of plates were handed down through the generations until they came into Mormon's possession. Mormon described the contentions among Benjamin's people, which included warfare with the Lamanites and difficulties in establishing the Nephite religion among the people of Zarahemla. It appears the situation was so bad that King Benjamin enforced laws against the teaching or preaching of false doctrines and false claims to be the Christ. Those people who would not accept the Nephite religion established by King Benjamin defected to the Lamanites. Thus, by laboring with all the might of his body and the faculty of his whole soul, King Benjamin, along with other Nephite prophets, established peace. 
We now switch from reading from the small plates of Nephi to reading Mormon's abridgment of the account that was on the large plates of Nephi. From this point forward, we're going to encounter a lot more history in the narrative. We'll also see that Mormon wrote mostly in the third person, using the pronouns he, she, and they, instead of in the first person, using I and we, as the writers on the small plates had. Mormon began most of the books he wrote, including Alma, Helaman, 3rd Nephi, and 4th Nephi, with a heading that explains and summarizes the book's contents. The Book of Mosiah, however, has no heading, but instead begins with a brief statement of historical transition. The missing heading appears to indicate that there was material that belonged to the Book of Mosiah that's missing from our copy of the Book of Mormon. The printer's manuscript of the Book of Mormon may support this conclusion. Oliver Cowdery originally wrote chapter three at the beginning of the Book of Mosiah and then changed it to chapter one by inking over the last two Roman numerals. This suggests that there were two previous chapters in the Book of Mosiah that were translated, but that no longer exist. They may have been part of the 100 lost manuscript pages. The heading to the Book of Mosiah may be in that section. The Book of Mosiah begins and ends the reign of King Benjamin, son of Mosiah. Benjamin had three sons, Mosiah, Helaram, and Helaman, and he instructed them in the Nephite language and beliefs. Benjamin caused that his son should be taught in all the language of his fathers, and he also taught them concerning the records which were engraven on the plates of brass. The phrase, the language of his fathers, refers to the modified Egyptian language that was written on the brass plates and the plates of Nephi. Mormon later explained that this language was called among the Nephites, the reformed Egyptian. Benjamin taught his sons how to keep the Nephite historical and scriptural records. In ancient societies, this task was limited to a handful who were scribes and were taught how to read and write. Among the Nephites, prophets, priests, and kings had this training. The importance of record keeping to sustaining religious belief is seen in Mosiah's discovery of the people of Zarahemla and their corrupted language and religion, as well by what had become of the Lamanites by King Benjamin's day. Mosiah 1 verse 5, quote, I say unto you, my sons, were it not for these plates, which have been kept and preserved by the hand of God, that we might read and understand of his mysteries and have his commandments always before our eyes, that even our fathers would have dwindled in unbelief, and we should have been like unto our brethren, the Lamanites, who know nothing concerning these things, or even do not believe them when they are taught them because of the traditions of their fathers, which are not correct." Unquote. The importance and urgency of keeping and reading scripture and sacred history is further underscored in Benjamin's plea to his sons in verses six and seven. Quote, O oh my sons, I would that ye should remember that these sayings are true, and also that these records are true. And behold, also the plates of Nephi, which contain the records and the sayings of our fathers from the time they left Jerusalem until now, and they are true. And we can know of their surety because we have them before our eyes. And now, my sons, I would that ye should remember to search them diligently, that ye may profit thereby. And I would that ye should keep the commandments of God, that ye may prosper in the land according to the promises which the Lord made unto our fathers." Unquote. Benjamin waxed old, and he saw that he must very soon go the way of all the earth. So he chose his oldest son, Mosiah, to succeed him as king. He commanded his son, Mosiah, to gather all the people of Zarahemla and all the people of Mosiah to the temple on the following day, where he said that he would proclaim unto this my people out of mine own mouth that thou art a king and a ruler over this people. And I shall give this people a name, 
that thereby they may be distinguished above all the people which the Lord God hath brought out of the land of Jerusalem. Benjamin then gave Mosiah full executive authority until he, Benjamin, died and transferred to Mosiah the symbols of the king's office, the brass plates, the small and large plates of Nephi, the sword of Laban, and the Leahona. That concludes this lesson. If you enjoyed it, please click the thumbs up button and leave a comment below. Please subscribe if you'd like to be notified when new lessons are posted to this channel and visit www.huarc.org to download these notes, this slideshow, and a handout I prepared for this lesson about the record keepers of the Plates of Nephi. In our next lesson, we'll discuss King Benjamin's teachings to his people at the temple in the land of Zarahemla. The reading is Mosiah chapters two through six. See you next time.